Welcome to Tracing Your Family Roots. My name is Arlene Sachs, and this is Chuck Mason, and today we'd like to welcome Carol Petranek. Welcome, Carol. I'm delighted that you could come here. Carol is one of the co-directors of the DC Family History Center. She's a coordinator for, the fam for Family Search and a re research specialist for, of Greece, the Greek correct. culture. Greek genealogy, that's correct. Um, so let's start, we're going to talk today about Family Search, so let's start with that and say, what is Family Search? Well, good morning. It's wonderful <laughs> to be here with you. Family Search is the world's largest free online genealogy website. Um, the Family History Library in Salt Lake City is the largest brick and mortar genealogy library in the entire world. Family Search has uh, been collecting records throughout the world for the last 100 years, especially uh, U.S. records, vital records, land, tax, etc., and many records overseas, particularly in Europe, British Isles, and uh, Germany, uh, Italy, all over Europe. So consequently, uh, while other organizations are fairly recent coming onto the genealogy scene, Family Search has been involved in this work for over a hundred years. So you have quite a few records then. We <laughs> have quite a few <laughs> records. <laughs> but about do you have everything? Uh, do is we, the question. Nobody <laughs> has everything, Chuck, and that's, uh, that's part of the challenge in today's uh, digital world. There are so many records that are coming online. Everybody is tech savvy now. Those in the genealogy community are so involved in going online to look for records. And consequently, uh, there is this quite a scramble to get these records digitized and online. With FamilySearch.org, any records that will ever be on the website will always be free of charge through Family Search. Um, it is not a subscription site, it is a free site. Uh, Family Search has, has many specialists in their areas, uh, such as uh, specialists in history and library science and digitization and digitization techniques, in languages, um, studies in the different areas of the world, uh, specialists in, in microfilming, digital imaging, etc. So it's quite a complex organization and a large organization. Much of Family Search is volunteer run and volunteer operated. And consequently, that's one of the reasons why the website and all the resources on the website are always free of charge. Well, you had an interesting uh, slide that maybe we can look at about uh, the, some of the digitizing tools. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. This is what a digitization setup looks like uh, for Family Search. Most people have never seen one. Basically, what it is is it's a camera with lights and uh, computer screens. And as the images are digitized, the people who are doing the digitization can see on the screen exactly the caliber and the quality of that digital image, whether it's, uh, it's good, if it's a little fuzzy, etc. It's a very simple operation. Most people would think it would be very complex, but as you can see from this slide, it is uh, a fairly simple operation. And Family Search does have what they call portable digital imaging packages where you can take them, uh, a, a camera, etc., to a location and actually digitize yourself. Oh, so you mean a person could borrow it and go someplace? And they are looking into doing this as part of a, an effort to get more local records digitized. Uh, Family Search, there are over 230 teams of microfilm specialists, uh, excuse me, digitization specialists throughout the world now, but there are so many records that are on the local level. There are maybe cemetery records or church records or, or records in local repositories and local archives. So Family Search is looking into these, what they call these portable. Um, are they doing anything with microfilming at all, or have they no, decided to? No, everything is now okay. digitized. Yeah, which is great. And uh, this, this next slide shows us a picture of the Granite Mountain Vault. It was built in 1965, and it's in the Rocky Mountains uh, south of Salt Lake City. It's earthquake proof, it's bomb proof, <laughs> uh, and consequently, it's, um, there are six chambers. The uh, images that are kept on digital hard drives are kept there, the hard images. Of course, there is the cloud. There are many clouds for family search, anywhere from five to seven throughout the world. So whatever is digitized 
a hard copy on a hard disk is kept in the Granite Mountain Vault, but then of course the digital copies are stored in seven different locations. Over the last hundred years, as Family Search has been collecting microfilm before they went digital. Those microfilm are kept here in this Granite Mountain Vault, as are other valuable and rare collections. Oh, well, when I was there, and uh, before we went, we had a conference there. There were about a thousand or twelve hundred at the time. Uh, they asked us to to get online and decide which. This was before a lot of it was on the web. Say which films we wanted, and then the Family History Center went there, made copies of them so that the copies would be in the yes. library when we got there. Otherwise, if you go to the library and then find a, a number that you want, the film number, then it takes a day or so till they can get it and, and do, That's bring, true. make a copy. They, well, they, at that time, they just made another microfilm copy. Exactly, so. yes. The original never leaves the vault. If you order a microfilm, then an image is made of that and it's sent over. Uh, at the Family History Library itself, there are thousands and thousands of rolls of microfilm, but not everyone, because there's two and a half million rolls of yeah. microfilm that are in this vault. So <laughs> consequently, there's no facility that can hold that much uh, to have them on demand. So if someone is going to Salt Lake City and they do want to go to the Family History Library, and let's take a look at the next screen because that, whoops, yeah. nope, yes it does. Yeah. It gives us a, a picture of the Family History Library. Uh, it's strongly recommended that you look to see if your uh, what you're looking for has first of all if it's already been digitized and millions of digital images are being uploaded every week if for some reason it has not yet been digitized it will be within the next four years maybe five Ancestry.com is partnering with Family Search to get all of those two and a half million rolls of microfilm as as digitized it, and online by the way it, uh, if People are looking at the screen. The one on the left was the one in, in Salt right. Lake City. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the times that I was there, the people were very, very helpful. Thank you. One, one question I have. I know currently with Ancestry, there are times when it will say there's a digital image, but you have to go into a mm -hmm. Family History Center to view it. Is there a plan that we would be able to go to the Family History Center website at, or uh, Family History Library website and view those from home, or, or are we always going to need to go in Chuck, to that a depends Family History on the, Center? That depends on the contract. Okay. Each uh, each repository has to sign a contract with Family okay. Search, and in that contract, it's decided whether the digital images can be viewed online, online for free. free or only at a family history center or the family, and some of them are only at the family history library. Ah. So consequently, it just depends, it, it's out of family searches control. It just depends on the repository. Well, let me use that example of what you found for me or what I found mm -hmm. after talking to you. Um, it's not been dig digitized. I know family history center had it. I even had the microfilm a number because I did this many years ago. And yet when we went in there um, and uh, looked under search, rather than trying to, I mean, obviously the person's name was not there. Looked under search and looked under the location, mm -hmm. which was in France. Um, then it suddenly came, it linked me to someplace else where they had digitized. It linked me to That's French. That's correct. To yes, French I looked site. up that film number for you that yeah. you had given me. And when I went into it, from the time that you had originally looked yeah. at that microfilm, it is now digitized and online at an archive in France. So if you look up that microfilm number today, you'll see a, a, a line that says, to view a digital image, click here. And you click on that word here. And it took me right out of Family Search. It took me into the archives in France. And from there, I was able to type the name of the town, and it brought up the records okay. for that town. Now, they're not indexed yet, which is a plug for indexing, <laughs> because what all of us love to be able to sit at a computer, type a name, and have those records come up. But in order for that to happen, somebody needs to go in, read those records, and extract the names, uh, type them into an index so that their name's searchable. That brings me to an, the other caveat of the indexing. Uh, whether it's Family Search or Ancestry or um, Ellis Island, people that are doing the indexing cannot necessarily read what's written there. And they, uh, you're dealing with many languages. The, the Ellis Island records are often those that 
uh, records that came from Europe with a, um, uh, a German or somebody else captain mm -hmm. who, who wrote down the things in their language and you sometimes come up with some weird, weird things. That's true, but I do want to put in a plug for family search indexers versus the indexing that's done by Ancestry or any of the other organizations. With family search, all of our indexing is done by volunteers. If you read English, you're going to index English records. You're not going to index records yeah. in German or records in, in another language, Russian, that you're not familiar with. Uh, those who can speak or read Italian and German and Russian will index those records. So consequently, we, we feel confident that the indexing done by Family Search indexing volunteers is pretty accurate, Relative. as accurate as can be. Some other organizations hire indexers who are not native speakers <laughs> of the language. And consequently, you know how hard it is to read English records as it is, census records, the handwriting of the census taker, et cetera, the Ellis Island records. Well, imagine if English was not your first language and you're being paid, you've been taught, but you're being paid to index these records and you just don't know what the names are. So consequently, that's why there are so that's many true. errors in many websites. Yeah, yeah and, and, and uh, even somebody that's not familiar with Jewish names or something like that, if you're mm -hmm. looking at German records, you think you're going to be able to read it. Mm -hmm. And you look at old, even old, old English. Yes. Look, look at it, just English, if you look at uh, our Constitution, the, 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 H is like an F with a hook and back. That's mm -hmm. one letter that's different. And there are many other letters that were just simply written differently. And uh, I know in, in German, many, very, very few of the Germans today can read that really old script. I, I run um, into that as well with my own personal research. So, so it, it's not only knowing the language, it's knowing the culture. Correct. If, if they're Jewish or, or, you know, I don't know about others, but it, I have an example of somebody asked once, uh, they came up with the name Ophelia and it couldn't possibly, you know, it just doesn't fit with naming patterns. Of course. And I just, I, the moment I, I saw that, um, I said, oh, it's got to be Sophie because mm -hmm. the German O in the old script looks like a, an O to us now, but mm -hmm. that's an S. Yes. And then the PH, they just read of, as Ophelia mm -hmm. in, 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 instead of Sophie. And, and I have an English one. My great-grandfather, Alexander, got indexed as Elizabeth. <laughs> <laughs> so going back it's to the two, yeah, two okay, pictures going that back we to had, the, the, one on, the one on the right is Carol's Family History Center. Uh, yeah, let's in, talk about that Actually, one. it's the Washington, D.C., but it's in Kensington, Maryland. It's in Kensington, Maryland. Just across the border. Right, exactly, Maryland, around yeah. the Beltway. Um, I am one of the co-directors. There are four of us that um, operate that Family History Center. Linda Christensen is the director and there are uh, three other of us who are co-directors, so we work together to keep it going. And I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about family history centers. I think many people doing family history research may be aware of family history centers, but I run into people who are not. Yeah. And so I'd, I'd really like to chat for a little bit about the resources that are available there and how we can help people with their own personal research. I'm gonna focus on our Washington, D.C. Family History Center, but I do wanna point out that there are 4,861 family history centers all over the world in, in every continent. And every one of them is a little different. Some are open more hours than others. Uh, some have uh, are just strictly computers and in a small room. Some are full-fledged family history centers such as what we have in Kensington. We have books, we have uh, scanners, we have microfilm readers, we have uh, some other um, uh, amenities that I'll, I'll talk about as, as the discussion goes on. But I do want people to know that each center is different. So consequently, what we have in ours may not be in other centers. However, the one thing that does remain the same um, is the fact that people do have access to family history library microfilms. You can order a film if, it, if the film you want has not yet been digitized, 
They will be within the next couple of years, but if it's not digitized yet, you don't have to go to Salt Lake City. You can order that microfilm at home and have it sent to any family history center that's convenient to your location. There are websites that people would have to pay for. They're called subscription sites. And Family Search has contracts with uh, quite a few online website providers where you can access these sites for free at any oh. Family History Center, such as Ancestry.com, Fold3, MyHeritage, and uh, many others. So all of those are available at any Family History Center throughout the world. There's also personal assistance that people are going to get when they come into a Family History Center. One of the beauties of being a volunteer there is that your love for family history research enables you to support and help people coming in. And there are many who are just getting started. Some people may go online and, and go, you know, they yeah. see the commercials for Ancestry <laughs> and they go online and start typing in names and all of a sudden they type in a name that might be common and there may be you know, 20,000 hits. Yeah. And so they get overwhelmed and they don't know what to do. We um, encourage people to come into Family History Centers, bring the information that you already know about your family. Someone will sit down with you, they'll ask you questions, and they'll guide you in that research process. Now it's been a while since I've been at one, but I have to say that every time I've been there, I've, they've been a great help. Well, one of the things that I have found is you get people who will volunteer there who may know how to read old German script or lucky, you know, yeah. at the different family history centers depending on the interest and that can be a great help Absolutely. when you've got something that you can't read, you can't find help, mm -hmm. having that one-on-one -on -one that you can get that help. Absolutely. The other thing too is that if there is a volunteer working there who cannot help you, chances are they know somebody, somebody who, can. who can. Yes. And so they will put you in touch with people who can help you with your specialized uh, with your specialized needs. Yeah. And we're finding that even though so many resources are coming online, that people are still coming into family history centers because they like to get that personal help. Uh, I volunteer at the National Archives in Washington, D.C. every Monday. I volunteer as a genealogy aide in the research room, and I also am in a, working on the Civil War Widows Pension Project. I'm a citizen archivist, so I help with document preparation. But many times when I'm working in that research room and people come in, uh, they're, they're in D.C. for a conference or something, and they come in, and one of my favorites is, well, I came in to get my family tree. <laughs> and I'm saying, well, we'd be happy to help you get started with your research. Well, doesn't the government have it? The government has everything, don't they? So uh, what I do is I'll sit down with them personally because the people who work there are busy. So, and they love that personal attention, and I'll often refer them to their own family history center nearby their home when they go back. Um, so they can you didn't that mention help. it, but um, you've mentioned that there are a lot of family history centers, and that you, you can find out where it is by going on, on the, that website uh, familysearch.org. And uh, one of the things it'll say locations or something like that, and, and they can scroll down there and, uh, or type in where, where their zip code and it'll show them the closer. That, that is, to, and uh, another easy way to do it is to just go into a search engine and type family history center and your town and state. And you know, just I'm, I'm just right not up. tuned yet to do that kind of <laughs> Google research. I, uh, Sometimes that's easier to just go in and, and do a search for something yeah. specific than to. And the one thing I always caution people is if there are hours there, double check to make sure that they have updated and kept the yes. website up because not every family history center is diligent about that or occasionally something will come up that they have to close for some mm -hmm. reason so if particularly if you're going to travel a distance it's a good idea just to give them a call and make yeah, sure absolutely. that they will be there absolutely so you want to mention some of the things that that are available there. right on the family search portal on every family history center uh, some of the websites that you'll access for free are newspaper archives I mentioned ancestry.com and my heritage and I want to put in a plug for my heritage my heritage is, is an Israeli based company yes, that started about 10 years ago they have just grown exponentially in the last 10 years. 
many, many people in Europe and overseas, overseas from the U.S., put their trees up online at MyHeritage.com. That's what he's encouraging you to do, yes, we can. Yes, and yeah. anybody who does your, I do Greek research, of course, for my family, my husband's Czech, and, and he is finding that people in the Czech Republic are putting their trees up on MyHeritage. So oh. anybody doing overseas research definitely needs to check the MyHeritage uh, family trees and also the searches there. Uh, it's, it's just a great website. Um, there are several uh, websites for those doing research in the UK and um, also there's a terrific website that's um, a mapping program where you can go on in and look at maps, old maps uh, from all over the world. So these are available at any family history center anywhere in the world. Um, at our family history center at Washington DC we have what are called focus groups or special interest groups. We actually started using the word special <laughs> interest groups that Fairfax uses. And then somebody says, that sounds really political. <laughs> and I know we're in Washington. Do we want to use the word special interest use, groups? Use so SIG. We well, changed it. Abbreviated yeah. to SIG. We changed it to yeah. focus groups. It's basically the same thing. But we do have some at our Family History Center, and others may have them as well. Uh, we have a group doing African American research. It's such a large group that we actually close to the public on Mondays. And people who are coming in doing African American research have that whole facility to themselves. We have a DNA group, a group that's uh, focused on Eastern European research, which has just started, which is becoming very popular, and which will probably at some point break into different segments of Eastern European because it's such a big area. Uh, we also have a large Irish group, and we also have a Roots Magic group. So family history centers may specialize in groups that would be of interest to people doing different types of research. Fairfax Genealogy Society or the Mount Vernon one should have one that, that what was the last thing you mentioned? Uh, they, Roots, Roots Magic. Magic yeah, cause I, I need help in that. Oh. I, because I've, I use the family, uh, the, 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 the one, what do you call it? For, for umpteen years, uh -huh. the, the, the one path, from, yeah, path, yeah. yes, and and they're not supporting that anymore. No. So how to get the roots magic, and I sometimes still get lost on that. Come on Saturday, the third Saturday morning of the month, where we have a, a, a roots magic at what time? meeting. Starts at nine thirty, and it's great. It's just very open ended, and and lots of people to support you. There um, is one thing that we have at our Family History Center that is not in many of them, but it is at the Family History Library in Salt Lake City and some of the larger Family History Centers, which is this incredible <laughs> Canon photo scanner. This will take up to eight and a half and 11 uh, pieces of paper. And the difference between this photo scanner and doing a flatbed scanner is this works like a copy machine. You put a stack of 25 photos in, and they start, it feeds through one at a time. And as each image is fed through the scanner, it becomes its own digital image. And consequently, we have scanned almost 500 photos an hour. Wow. Once you get your photos sorted and stacked the way you want them, you bring them in, sit down at this machine and just put them in and just watch them go. They'll Do they all have to be the same size? Uh, th we suggest sorting them by size. size. Mm -hmm. But most photos, most current photos, are four by six. But then yeah. you start getting into the older ones. The Remember older ones? the smaller I've, ones? I've, I've, with, I've with got the, ones that are like an inch the, and a half yeah, by an inch and a half. Or the rough edge ones. That the you rough, had, they work fine. They go through they'll fine. Go through. The one and a half inch ones uh, won't go through That's the fair. scanner. But what, what this program does is it has a flatbed scanner. So you could put, it's a large flatbed. So you could put maybe eight or 10 of those one and a half inch ones on there and it'll scan each image individually as an individual picture. And would you, do you have to sort black and white from colored photos or? Uh, yeah, you okay. should, you should. So because it, your it color is going it. to scan in color, the black and white and will scan black and white. And then what does it put them on for you to take home? Well, it's, these scans are at the com in the computer and then you just put in your flash, flash drive, drive and it copies them. It's such an easy way to do it. It's free to use, and uh, we have many people coming from Virginia uh, <laughs> around the Beltway to use this uh, photo scanner. It's just an amazing, an amazing wait, resource. Wait. The other thing we do have at our Family History Center, and we encourage people from, really, from anywhere to come and use it is our oral history room. Uh, we have professional video and audio equipment. You can do an interview with someone, 
and uh, walk out with the DVD of that interview. Uh, there is a $5 charge for the DVD, but other than that, there's there's no associated is cost. Per, like if I went there, would I be doing the interview, or do you have uh, somebody that'll do you the interview? You would be doing the interview. Okay, you don't have people doing the interview Correct. For you. Let's say you had an aunt who came yeah. into town, and she was somebody that had a lot of family stories, and you wanted to capture those stories. Then you would You would just to. bring her in and sit down and, and conduct the interview with her. Or, as an individual, you can sit down and tell your own story and capture it on a on a DVD. Okay. So these are some of the resources we have at our Family History Center. And Family History Centers, as I said before, are focused on the individual. They're focused on the individual experience. They're focused on giving personal attention to the individual researcher. Yeah, and, and again, I, I think they're, they're a ter tremendous source. And 30 years ago, when I first started genealogy, I kept saying, if I could use only one source mm -hmm. ever, uh, I'd use the Family History Center because I was able to find the microfilms at that time that I, that I needed. And of course now you've got everything online and much more, so that's, uh, that's more true than ever. But uh, because you've got, you know, you've got the civil records, you've got, you know, all sorts of church records and mm -hmm. Uh, circumcision and more, records and there's more, stuff. more being digitized every day. It's not that Family Search is just taking what they have and, and digitizing it. There are camera teams all over the world today. Some of the largest projects currently are in Italy. There is an, in, the Family Search has signed a contract with the Italian government to digitize the civil records oh. of, of Italy. So there is much indexing to be done on those records. Anybody who can uh, read Italian <laughs> is in or, or early Latin, which is what they were written in the Catholic Church records and some of the other civil records, is encouraged to get online and do some indexing. Russia, uh, Ukraine, uh, many areas in, in what was uh, formerly Eastern Europe are now being uh, digitized. Well, thank you online. very much. It's, it's been very interesting very and I've learned a lot, yes. Well, thank very. you. It's great to be here. Thank you so much.